Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with a managing director of a big four accounting firm where she runs the Chief Legal Officer Program. We discussed her unconventional journey after big law, her love to connect people and share ideas, her insights in the future of the legal industry, and her love for sports, and so much more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes. We interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsel, and legal consultants. You're listening to episode 55 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of both men and women serving as leaders and executives in the legal industry. Enjoy a front row seat as Chris Batt speaks with general counsel, legal consultants, and law firm leaders and law partners at the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Lori Lorenzo, Research and Insights Director of Deloitte in Northern Virginia. Lori is a Managing Director with Deloitte Transactions and Business Analytics and leads research and insights for the Chief Legal Officer Program. In this role, she hosts training events of new, current, and future Chief Legal Officers as a free service. Prior to Deloitte, Lori was the Deputy Director for the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity in DC, and also the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the Career Development Office at the University of Miami School of Law. Lori received her law degree from Duke. Welcome, Lori, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Chris. I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. So, Lori, let's just jump in with your career. What led you to want to be an attorney in the first place? I was one of those kids that argued all the time. So as long as I can remember, my mom told me that I needed to be a lawyer. Uh, She did give me the alternative of becoming a doctor, but those were really the only two choices. Fortunately, unfortunately, I'm a little bit squeamish. So lawyer was really the only path. And when I got a little older and decided I liked writing and public speaking, it became a a more clear vision. But that was it. As simple as my mom telling me I had to do it. And you went to University of Florida? Is that correct? Law school? Uh, Well, no. University of Florida was my undergraduate and I, I got to play water polo there. So that was a lot of fun. And then I went to Duke for law school. That's right. And you ended up landing in a couple large law firms. Which were those? Yeah, I started at Kedwalader doing structured finance work. And then Dewey Ballantyne was coming into the Charlotte market about a year into my practice and aggressively recruiting. So I took the opportunity to jump right over. And on my first day at Dewey Ballantyne, they announced that they were merging with LaBeouf, Lamb and Green. And there I was at Dewey LaBeouf as a a very junior lawyer. And did you know some of the folks about relationship with kind of the end result of Dewey and LaBeouf? Only in a very casual way, right? So the people that were making the decisions about how the firm would manage its finances and its partner relationships were several security clearance levels above me. But of course, the chair of the firm from time to time visited our office and then everybody goes out to dinner. But no, I mean, and I was in the Charlotte office, not the New York office. So a lot of those decisions were happening way above my head. And I was a very junior attorney at the time. So I feel like even if I had been in those rooms, I may not have really even grasped what was going on. So what was your impression of being at a Cadwalder and a Dewey and LaBeouf as an associate? I have to say, so I came from really meager beginnings. There are no professionals in my family. We're a very blue collar family. So I entered the practice of law, much like many other diverse young lawyers, just thinking I had to work hard, right? Somebody would give me some work to do. I would work hard, do a good job, and my path would would progress. In hindsight, I just didn't understand the nature of the relationship building component, the nature of the, you know, the unspoken, the non-work piece of it. So I did what I described. I went in, I worked hard. I thought they were challenging environments to be in. I've always been the person that liked a challenge. 
So learning the ins and outs of structured finance and the language of the business, that stuff was all new, but I, I liked it. And I liked the thrill of the deal. I remember the first time I closed a deal in New York at the financial printer, it was such an interesting world to me because you're doing this really fascinating work, but also you're locked in this room for 12, 14, 15 hours And I still thought that was amazing, mostly because there was a concierge and you could say, hey, I want some Starbucks and they'd bring it in or I want sushi for lunch and they'd bring it in. I just never had that kind of professional experience. And it was this amazing new world where you did this interesting work and there were all of these other things going on. I just remember enjoying it very, very much. So you brought up relationship and kind of the unspoken and some of those things aren't really talked about in law school. We're going to definitely address that today. And I want my listeners to know that that this is going to be an important part of your journey as you shared about that. So what led you to leave big law? Oh, well, I was given a non-negotiable invitation to exit when Dewey LaBeouf imploded. So I, I remember that day very clearly. The Charlotte office was only about eight or 10 lawyers, and they put us all in a conference room kind of after that summer of <laughs> discontent where the markets were crashing. And the chair of the firm walked in with a couple of transition specialists and announced to the group, we're closing the firm. We have some transition specialists that will will try to help you find something else. But really, it was too late. The other firms in structured finance had already done mass layoffs all across the country. There were no jobs for structured finance lawyers. Uh, And so that was just a really, really tumultuous time for me and my colleagues. But it was a forced move. And honestly, I I wouldn't have made it. I I probably would have stayed the path to partnership because like I said, I I very much enjoyed my practice. But uh, looking back and, and the path I've taken since then, it was a great turning point, really caused me to look at things differently, explore things I would have never, never imagined. So not what I thought I wanted, not where I thought I would be, but it turned out all right. And you had ventured into your own business at that point too, correct? Well, no. So uh, we started a business just after that. So at the point that Dewey announced that it was closing down, my first husband and I, A, we were expecting our fourth child, which is an interesting uh, experience trying to interview fully pregnant. But he he had been in the army and at the time was on stop loss, which just basically means even if you're on an enlisted contract, you can't leave until the army says you can leave. And his stop loss ended roughly within a week of Dewey's announcement. So there we were expecting the fourth baby and uh, both unemployed. And we took stock of our savings and our assets. And we moved to a beach town in Florida and opened a martial arts studio. That was a great experience. So it seems completely unrelated to anything, right? It's a a jujitsu studio. We did some fitness classes. We ran kids camps. But we were doing that in the context of the economic recession in a small town where the average income was was modest compared to Charlotte or take a Miami, especially New York. And I learned some valuable tools. Um, a, I could I could choke a person out if I needed to. So that's important. <laughs> but uh, but more practical than that was the business side, right? We were asking people to write a check for membership when they were struggling to otherwise make ends meet. So there's an element of marketing there. I started to discover this element of relationship and trust in the context of business. People had to trust that we were providing a valuable resource to their kids, you know, to to them through this martial arts studio. And so just really focusing on how do I build a loyal set of customers here that trust us with their money, with their business, with their fitness. And those are lessons I've been able to take with me through each subsequent step of the journey. And how long did you do that with the studio? We own the studio, I think, three or four years. So a couple of years into it, I stepped back from active uh, leadership and I stopped teaching because I transitioned back into law-related experiences and careers. But I ran the business end of it three or four years. And then we were able to sell the business. We, we disassembled it. And so we sold our client list. We sold our gear kind of in bits and pieces. Uh, so a few years, a few years. 
And what opened that door? Do you look back at the legal career? <laughs> so, uh, you know, a couple of years into the the fitness life, which I absolutely love and I, I still stay connected to a couple of things. My law student loans came off of uh, financial hardship deferment. So there were some people knocking on my door for that. But more than that, I went to law school with a passion and I loved my practice and I just really missed it. I missed the intellectual challenge, this, the stimulation, the, the thrill of the deal. And I wanted to get back into it. And so I, I took a kind of unconventional turn. I said, I need to figure out how to meet a lot of people really quickly. And so I started waiting tables at a sports bar because I figured roughly half of lawyers are men and some men like sports, some women like sports. So I got a decent chance of getting a lawyer at one of my tables one night. And that's exactly what happened. I had a table of uh, prosecutors from the local office come in one afternoon for, for lunch. And I started chatting. It's funny, I, half of my friends said, you shouldn't tell anyone at the restaurant that you're a lawyer. They're gonna think you're a terrible lawyer waiting tables. <laughs> Uh, but I went against that advice. So I started talking to them. I told them I was a lawyer, a little bit about my background, and they made an introduction to a friend of theirs that worked at the local law school. And that turned into my entry back into the legal profession. Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, legal recruiter and owner of The Lion Group. My team and I place legal and compliance talent around the United States and are known for our level of communication, speed, and strong track record. If you're an employer hiring your first attorney or first general counsel or adding talent to your corporate legal department or compliance team, we should talk. Also, if you're a corporate defense law partner or group wondering about your options for a lateral move, we should also talk. Every aspect of our process is confidential, fast, and thorough. Contact us by going to our website, findthelions.com, or you can text the word HEADHUNTER to the number 44222, and then complete the web form, and we'll follow up with you shortly. Now back to the show. Did you think you'd go into career development at a law school? I did not. Uh, well, I I never imagined that if you'd asked me in law school, if, if that was a path, I would have said no. But when the opportunity came up, my intention was to do that to meet the local legal employers and then leverage that into a, a practice job. And it's funny, I did get a couple interviews that way. I interviewed with one firm and I sat down with the hiring partner and he said, uh, I don't think I'm going to hire you because I don't think that your big law experience actually gave you any real skills. So that was, I don't know how you respond to that. I just smiled. <laughs> he said, but I don't get a Duke law grad application very often. So I thought I would just meet you. So we had a nice conversation and then he proceeded to not hire me. That was a, a similar story, right? Uh, in this small beach town I was in, nobody thought that my big law experience had any practical applicability to you know, the family law, the person against person litigation that they were representing. And so I stayed in career services. It turns out I really liked it. So that opportunity is an opportunity to invest in young lawyers when they're hopeful, excited, when they've got a, a blank slate ahead of them. And being part of that enthusiasm for the practice was really aligned to the experience I had had when I did practice. So let's just pause for a moment. I'd love for you to give advice to attorneys who are kind of in that pinch where for some reason a firm folded or economic reasons pushed them out of a job. What advice would you give to an attorney who's um, looking to either get back into the profession? I would say keep an open mind. So talk to everyone about anything all the time and follow up on every lead. You know, one thing I've seen over the years is that uh, two people will meet and one person will say, hey, reach out, let me know, how can I help? And the other person doesn't always have a, this is how you can help me. And it's okay to not have that in the moment, but letting that opportunity slide, never getting back in touch is, is really, I think, a mistake. So just, again, it's the relationship piece, maintaining those relationships, keeping people updated, being open to anything anywhere. I mean, nobody would have guessed, myself included, that waiting tables at a sports bar in a beach town would have led to the path I'm on. But really, that was the turning point. So just keep at it. Keep at it. It sounded like you were incredibly optimistic because that was the kind of the plan in mind and it happened. So that pre kind of 
focused premeditated thoughts uh, really served you, it sounds like. Yeah, I am a big believer that what we set our sights on is the path that we take. You kind of put this energy into the world around you and you attract Mm -hmm. something that's aligned to that energy. And so, you know, if you put it out there that I'm going to get back into a career, back into a passion, then you talk about that, you engage around that, you have enthusiasm around that. People can't help but naturally respond positively to a positive Uh, outlook. The other thing is I could not have shown up at the restaurant in a bad mood. Like, you know, I had a manager at the restaurant who didn't care that I was a lawyer that went to Duke. He cared if I was late. He cared if I brought cold food to the table. He cared if I was rude to the customer. So you really had to show up and take ownership of this waitress job and do a really good job at it. Uh, So I think that's the other piece of advice. Wherever you land, be fully invested in that thing and and take whatever skills you can and build them. Lori, what about being in career services at a law school that just was catalytic and kind of helped advance this journey for you? Yeah. So the first law school I worked at uh, was Florida Coastal School of Law in uh, Jacksonville. And that it was a very large law school. And, you know, there's some controversy about that. uh, Actually, that group of law schools, they were for profit. But the experience was that there were law students there who really wanted to be lawyers. They were just so passionate. So maybe they hadn't done well on LSATs or as undergrads, but there was a passion in that group of students. And I, I keep in touch with a few of them now, just this drive to have a successful legal career which you couldn't help but but take some of that on and just be so inspired and and bend over backwards to get these people connected to their future. To me, that was just a, an experience that I'm so glad I had to be connected to that passion, that optimism. From there, at, at a networking event, I met uh, the woman that runs career services for the University of Miami. And she and I became instant friends. I'll never forget, we were at this uh, event And someone was talking her head off and you could see by the look on her face that she just wanted to escape. And so I walked up to introduce myself and she, she acted like we had been friends forever. And she said, Oh, I'm so (laughs) glad to see you. And, uh, are you ready to go sit down and have dinner? And so I ended up at dinner with this woman and to this day, we're, we're best friends. She invited me to come work at the university of Miami, which an offer I couldn't turn down. Miami is home for me. And, you know, I had four children at the time, all my family is there. And, and so we moved back and it's, it was really her investment, Marcy. Cox, she's the Dean of Career Services at UM. I think she saw something that I didn't even know I had. And she brought me in to run the diversity and inclusion program for University of Miami. And she gave me one rule. She said, don't let work fall on my lap and you can do anything you want. And that was such a welcome invitation to me. I, I started writing articles and being involved in the career services professional associations and working in partnership with law firms on diversity and inclusion, it was like a kid in the candy store for me. There's so much that I could do. And she let me do all of it. It it was just an intense period of growth for me. It's interesting to hear you come alive as you're describing almost like this blank canvas for you. The two rules. What about it did you discover about yourself as you've almost felt like actuated or catalytic in that moment, uh, stepping into something, you're given all the permission, and then you realize these skills or this personality you bring to the role? Oh, what a great question, Chris. So I learned a lot of things uh, during that time. So first of all, I've always been a very curious person. Uh, I have asked a lot of questions. My mom probably hated that when I was little, but I've I've always asked a million questions. I want to know how this works. Why do we do it this way? That really has served me in the legal profession and in the work I've done career services here at Deloitte. So I learned that that's a, a really useful skill. People love to talk about themselves. And so if you could just get people talking, but you learn so much about what people do, what drives them. And learning those things makes it really easy to connect people, right? So I had the privilege of meeting the general counsel for the Minnesota Vikings at one point. Just really nice guy. We got to talking. And I had a student at that time who just had this passion for football. I mean, he probably could have recited stats backwards in his sleep. 
And so just getting to know those two people at separate times and then being able to connect them on a level that was really personal. So that connection point for me. So I learned that about myself. I love connecting people and ideas. So there's that. The other thing I learned, and and this maybe was a little bit more challenging a lesson. So I would say when I was young, uh, I really thought that all people had the same starting line in life. All people had the same opportunity in life. And as I worked on this DEI stuff, and I really came to understand the mechanisms at work in success in the legal profession, I came to realize that that just wasn't true. And and to me, it's a, a great injustice. And so I was really motivated by my role in trying to make a difference here, right? So one person certainly isn't going to fix all of the inequities in the profession, but I definitely could help some people take a bigger step than maybe they could have done on their own. And so making those connections, connecting with other people that were passionate about the same things and just launching careers. I mean, I see it this way. One person who practices law can have a really great career, impact a ton of people through their practice. But one person that launches excited, enthusiastic attorneys almost gets to multiply the potential for impact. So that's how I saw it. And every minute of it was pretty thrilling. I mean, that sounds extremely, I mean, use the word impact, but it had such a huge influence on your own life, maybe discovering Mm -hmm. things about yourself and where your professional career is going. Talk to me about how uh, you were approached for Leadership Council on Legal Diversity. Yeah, that's a, a mixed personal professional story. So while I was at the University of Miami, my first husband and I decided that we probably needed to go our separate ways. And I would have to characterize that as I was probably a bit more surprised by that decision than he was. Mm. And so I found myself with four very young children, two of them weren't even school age yet, in a job I absolutely loved, but probably um, wasn't enough to financially sustain the, the single mom life. And so I started calling all my connections. And, and what I said was, listen, I need a job. I am happy to go back to practice. I, put me in as a first year associate. I don't care. I just need something that has a more concrete career path. Because in the, in the law school environment, you know, deans don't retire. So there's not a lot of, you know, you get your incremental annual, but there's not a lot of forward trajectory, which was fine in the time that I was there. But at this moment in time, I really needed a little bit more of a path to some financial security. And I called uh, my girlfriend, Valerie Jackson, who at the time was uh, DEI and recruiting for KNL Gates. And I said, Valerie, I don't care if you put me in your office in the middle of like North Dakota or for me, anywhere that's really cold is like the worst possible place to be. Uh, so I don't have anything against North Dakota, but man, I would have needed a lot of coats. I said, just just get me in the game. And she, she said, uh, Lori, I think you'd be a great lawyer, but I don't think that's where your truest and best and highest value is. She said, the chair of my firm is on the board for this new nonprofit uh, based in DC. And they're looking for someone that will help build out their DEI programs. And she said, I think you'd be really good at that. So let me make some calls. And she did. And I interviewed for that. And and that's how I ended up uh, transitioning into the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to her to this day. And the story, if you'll grant me this um, sidebar. So uh, Valerie Jackson is just uh, this woman with intense passion for everything she does. And she she walks into a room and, and kind of everyone looks because she just has this presence about her. And I saw her first at, a, it was an LGBT bar, Lavender Law Conference, and she was on a panel and I was sitting way in the back early in my career services uh, experience. And I remember seeing her and saying, I, I need to get to know this person. She has such energy for this work. I mean, she's just amazing. And so like like all good fangirls, I decided to figure out how I could get engaged. And I found out she was on a bunch of uh, committees through uh, NALP, which is the, the industry group for recruiting DI. And I joined all the same committees. And uh, little by little, we, we started to get to know each other. And now we're definitely besties. We vacation together and um, our families know each other well. So 
she's just been a friend time and time again. And so she connected me to LCLD and I packed up the four kids and the dog and away we went. So I continue to hear this evolving thing for you about relationships. That is uh, definitely a theme. I just, I just think you can't do it alone. You can't do life alone. You can't do work alone. You can't do parenting alone. There are just not many things you can do at the highest levels alone. And don't get me wrong. I think everyone needs some alone time in their life, uh, particularly if you have a lot of kids. But uh, you just can't get through everything all by yourself. You need a tribe. You need a team. You need a board of directors, whatever you call it. You have to have it. Lori, was this innate in you to develop relationship, to build trust, to kind of build that network? Or where did you learn that? Um, no, it, it wasn't innate, Chris. I mean, as a kid, so I was a little fat kid on the playground, right? I, I really we was. We all were at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely not the cool kid. I, I didn't grow up with much. So I didn't, in Miami, um, sneakers are a really big deal. Uh, I, I never had the cool ones. I didn't have the cool clothes. I was a little fat kid. So no, I, I was always felt, at least I always felt like I was on kind of on the outskirts. I was I was painfully shy. I kept to myself for the most part. I mean, I'm I'm lucky in Miami I had a, a big family and and so my my cousins kind of pushed me into whatever they were doing. They're all of them much more social than me. And even in in college, I only had one or two good friends. And in law school, I already had uh, my first baby before we started law school. I went to school. I took care of my baby. I went to school. I took care of my baby. I did not establish those bonds in law school that many people do. I didn't understand that that would be so important. So it was really, I think the turning point for me was really that experience at University of Miami. I mean, Marcy mentored me. I don't even know if I knew at the time what she was doing, but she really pushed me into these things. She made the introductions. Uh, she showed me by example that that these things were so important. And then I think the passion for the work created the relationships. I, I don't know that I was walking around saying, hey, will you be my friend? I think it was more that we have this shared passion. And so we created the bonds of shared experience. And so, no, I don't I don't know that it came naturally. But I think once I found the thing that I, I was just really excited about, the the connections came. Thank you for sharing that. And Leadership Council on Legal Diversity, you were in Washington, D.C. for five years, which is further north. So I'm sure you had some winters you had to deal with up there. Yeah, I do own a good coat now. <laughs> and it sounds like you're still there. Talk to us about Deloitte. How did that happen? Yeah, so I was uh, with Leadership Council on Legal Diversity just a little bit over five years. I really did not have any plans to leave. I loved the work. Uh, that organization is so impactful for so many people. And like University of Miami, I came in the door relatively early in the life cycle of that organization. And uh, my boss, Robert Gray, had a similar conversation. He said, here's what I really want to accomplish. And then he let me do it. And so again, it was this opportunity to create and invent and build uh, which I love. And I was in rooms, I'll never forget the first board meeting of LCLD. So the board of LCLD are these uh, legal giants. I mean, the the chief legal officer of Microsoft at the time was Brad Smith, the, the chief legal officer of Walmart and Starbucks, like these iconic brands. And here I am, I, I think I was, I don't know, 34, 35, walking into this room with these people that were just, I mean, making these intense decisions just really on the cutting edge of, of all things legal. And the chairs of like Scadden was on our board. And I remember the first meeting, I was like, I should just probably not say anything this whole time. But that experience, that exposure, just even listening to the way this group of people thought about problems and challenges was such a formative experience. And that they allowed me to be part of that. And, and with time, they allowed me to, to partner with them to create solutions and to have ideas. Just, I mean, I'm so grateful for, for their patience, A, in, in helping me develop in those ways, but also for the investment that they made, whether they were doing it intentionally or not. And so um, in that role, I had the opportunity to build out these 
uh, diversity and inclusion programs for lawyers at some of some of the biggest law firms and the biggest corporations. Uh, I really was focused on the impact. So by this time, I had a slight frustration about this DEI work that didn't always feel like it was being held accountable. So we're going to do this thing, but we're not going to measure what impact it has or how much growth. And so I focused on LCLD on measuring. We're doing these great things. It feels good to do it. And that is good. But let's also make sure we're we're moving the needle. We're actually having an impact we can measure. And if we're not, let's do something different. Let's tweak, let's change, let's ideate. And so I, I built out programs there. I built out a, a data and metrics and analytics system in partnership with the American Bar Foundation and uh, a company at the time called Lawyer Metrics. And I just loved every single minute of that. And I, I would have never left, but I had this experience. So about um, three years into that, someone said, hey, did you know that Deloitte has this whole training campus in Texas? I said, no, I didn't. And I um, secured an invitation to go out there to check it out. At the time, I think it was uh, Kenji Yoshino was doing some research in collaboration with Deloitte and they were doing this big reveal of the research. And so I got an invitation to that and I got there and I remember thinking like, this place is pretty cool. And so I started a relationship with uh, the folks who work in legal uh, for Deloitte. And they ultimately invited LCLD and its board to come out to do some strategic planning for LCLD's future. So at three, about three years in, we had grown exponentially. Our staff was still really small. We had this influential board and we, we really wanted to stop and say, how are we going to be um, really thoughtful about our steps forward? How are we going to make sure we stay true to mission? We don't overextend. We continue to have a positive impact. And Deloitte, basically said, well, we have uh, we have some experience with helping uh, companies figure that out. So why don't you come out and we'll help you? And we spent two, two or three days out there in this strategic planning, what Deloitte calls lab. And we came out of it with a really strong strategic plan. And I remember leaving campus after that experience and saying, I love LCLD and I'll stay here for as long as they'll have me. But if I ever leave, uh, this is the kind of place I want to be. And then I happily went about my life with LCLD. And a couple years after that, that statement in my mind had been long forgotten. I got an email on LinkedIn from a, a recruiter, a Deloitte side recruiter. And they said, you know, we're looking for someone to help build out this CLO program. And uh, it requires a collection of skills and experiences that are not super common, right? So exposure to law firm and in-house leadership, an academic background that includes research and writing, some programming, so building out training and, and relationship building experiences. Uh, will you come talk to us? And and I did, and, and here I am. While you were at LCLD, I imagine you received other overtures of opportunities. Why Deloitte? So you're you're right. I did I did have so uh, here's you've been asking advice throughout. So let me just sidebar with a piece of advice. So I have always felt like it's important to talk to anyone that has an opportunity, uh, not necessarily because you're being untrue or disrespectful of the role you have, but because I think it's important to understand your value in the market. So you it's important to see through someone else's eyes what you're doing that's impactful, what people value, and and what your collective experiences mean to the profession. So I would encourage anyone listening, every time you get that email on LinkedIn, to just have the conversation. Uh, you don't have to progress it, but have the conversation so you can see yourself through someone else's eyes. So there's that. So the invitations to join a particular firm in a, a DEI role or in a talent role, those were interesting and they had potential. But I always stated LCLD because the potential impact there was so broad. There were so many people. We had, you know, two or 300 law firms and corporations being impacted by our programs every single year. So to me, that multiplier effect was so energizing in a way that working in a single firm may not have been. And then when Deloitte approached me, the, the two things that really sold me on the transition was the platform and what I'll call the waterfront. So at LCLD, I was impacting lawyer careers in one element in, in diversity and inclusion. 
at Deloitte, my focus is the entire experience of law practice for in-house lawyers. So everything from technology to strategy to transformation to talent to DEI, I get to, to think through all of that alongside just some of the smartest people I've ever known who, who specialize. So I'm kind of that inch deep and a mile wide, but I work side by side with people who have spent their whole careers focused on legal technology, for example, or transformation or change management. The other thing about Deloitte that was really attractive is it's a global platform. So, you know, if, if it isn't clear already, my goal is always broad impact and that global platform. I, I mean, I just couldn't couldn't turn that down. And I, I guess the third reason is, you know, if you can tell from my path so far, what I've learned about myself is I love the opportunity to create and grow. So except for my law practice years early on, every job I've had since then didn't exist before I took it. So the job at Florida Coastal, the job at UM, no one had been in those roles. They're completely blank slate. And the same is true with uh, this role at Deloitte. Uh, similar jobs exist for the finance function or the HR function, but this job for the legal function didn't exist. And so I had the opportunity to come in and say, how do I, how do I make the most of this? So please explain with my listeners, what is the CLO program? Sure. So Deloitte has a series of what we call role-based programs focused on the executive functions. And the, the mission of each of these programs is to come side by side with these executives to partner with them along the course of their career. It's not a sales program. It's a relationship program. So for example, the firm never charges for my time. I spend time with CLOs. I spend time with legal teams. That's all a relationship building investment in our clients. The CLO program in particular offers a few resources to our clients. One is our Next Gen Training Academy. So GCs or CLOs choose someone in their line of succession to come out and do some training. We do that at our Deloitte University. Uh, we do transition labs. So someone that's new in a CLO role will sit down with them for two days, kind of like the lab experience I had with LCLD. We'll sit down with them for two days and help them build out the strategy for success in their role. We do forums. So we bring groups of GCs together to talk about hot topics and trends. Uh, my role here is research and insights. So I design research initiatives. Uh, most recently, for example, we did a survey on COVID responses. So my thought was I want to understand the pressure that's on the legal function as a result of COVID and how they're thinking about progressing out of it. What is their uh, outlook for the future so that we can develop the resources that support that journey. And then we also have a training function called our learning center. So we design almost like CLE programs that are created to share our collective wisdom. Like I said, we've got these great experts uh, who are just doing these amazing things around strategy, technology, change, operational style function, centers of excellence. I mean, all of these uh, new ways of running a business. So we've turned those into training modules and we deliver those to clients. So just this suite of opportunities to build and grow relationships. And the sole goal is, is so our clients know that we're invested in their success. And we really are. We want them to be successful in their jobs. It's extraordinary. Now, is that all free? Uh, it is all free. There are a couple of the training programs that have a, a small price tag just because there's some materials involved, but it's largely free uh, for our mm -hmm. clients. That's exciting. It's extraordinary. So what is it like to work for a, a large law firm or one of the top four in the country? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be really honest. And I've shared this with, with my boss. So this isn't going to surprise anyone if, if they listen in. I was really challenged, I'd say, in the first eight or nine months of being here because I went from LCLD, which is a, a tiny organization. I mean, just fantastic talent, this mighty team but really small. I knew everyone by name. I knew their kids. I knew what they were working on to this giant organization. And it was very overwhelming to understand who's who, what role do they have? What relationship do I need to have with them? Uh, but more than that, it was the, the mission that was a challenge. So the mission of LCLD is very clear. And it was one I could easily be aligned to 
when I came to Deloitte, I wondered if I had made a mistake and aligned myself to, you know, a money making enterprise that I was struggling to feel aligned to the mission. And I talked to some people about it and I'll I'll never forget one partner said, you know, we may be a a for-profit entity, but we serve a valuable purpose in the market to help people feel assured that um, companies are operating in an ethical fashion, that the finances of of enterprise are, are true and reliable, trustworthy. And that really was a turning point for me in understanding what Deloitte does for our communities, for our country, for the globe, and the clients we serve. And it's not just in ensuring, you know, in the audit process, ensuring that that financial information is trustworthy. And uh, it's also in in this commitment to helping our clients be successful. And so when I was able to place my role in the big picture and understand that this is this is a real thing the firm's committed to. And and I was scared after after the uh, experience I had at Dewey in the financial crisis when COVID hit. I was scared. I was, I don't charge for my time. This, who knows what the finances of any company are going to do as a result of this pandemic. And time and time again, the firm reaffirmed its commitment to the success of its clients. And um, all of our role-based programs are still completely intact, still giving to our clients, supporting our clients through these really challenging times. So I just, I have a lot of admiration for this firm and the way they've navigated the difficulties of COVID, not just for our clients, but how we've treated our people throughout this process, how we've remained invested in all of the things we say are important to us, kind of our ethical and moral compass. I I haven't seen any waiver in terms of our commitment to those things. That's awesome. Lori, let's just talk for a brief moment about kind of the elephant of the room of the constant evolving change, acceleration of change to the legal industry. And I just want to hear from your perspective, how you see uh, the influence of big accounting in the legal industry. What are you seeing? Can you share with my listeners that your perspective? Yeah, I mean, first I'll say that I'm so excited by the change. And I know that enthusiasm is not universally shared by everyone in the profession. Uh, Some people are quite comfortable with the way we've always done it. It's a predictable, reliable thing. But I see so much potential in transformation because... I think in some ways, if you study kind of the trajectory of in-house counsel and and the rise and fall of prominence of the the general counsel and the legal function, you'll see that um, there was a period of time where that, that function was not highly esteemed. And as we've come back from that and we've attempted to quite successfully to reestablish the function as a value add, which I, I do think it is seen that way today, we perhaps have taken on some responsibilities that that aren't aligned to our highest and best purpose as in-house lawyers. And so with the introduction of technology and efficiency, we can pull out some of the things that are maybe not as as valuable, but are still necessary and just empower lawyers to work on the big, difficult, hard problems, really contribute value and insight and help an enterprise navigate risk and opportunity in ways you can't when you have to review law firm bills line by line, for example, or, you know, you just get stuck in some of the process. So I'm, I'm hugely excited at what could be true for the future of our profession. Um, In terms of the entry of the big four, I'm always surprised that anybody's surprised that that's happened. Uh, I would say we're well positioned to to help the legal function. I mean, we, we help the finance function, the HR function. We work with the CEOs. So we have insight across the enterprise, which which is helpful. If, if you're leading a legal function, it's good to know how the finance function runs things or what the CEO's perspective is on, on future growth. Uh, Right now, we're focused on the operations of the legal function, right? Deloitte is not authorized to practice law in the United States, so we don't do that. But we have a lot of insight in terms of transformation and and modernization and the operation of the function. And I'm glad that we're able to make some impact there. Let's pivot. So you mentioned you were raised in Miami Mm -hmm. and you were born in the United States, but you have parents from outside the United States, correct? 
Uh, I do. Yeah. I, I was born in Florida in Orlando, Florida. Um, my mom was born in New York, but my grandmother, who is the, uh, the matriarch of the family or who was before her passing, she came from Puerto Rico when she was 18 years old to New York. She was a seamstress in a factory. And one by one, she brought the family over uh, from Puerto Rico. Everybody that came from Puerto Rico came through her house in New York. And uh, at this point, I'd say probably 95% of, of that side of the family is is here in the States. And then on my father's side, my father came from Cuba when he was uh, about 13 years old, when Castro said, you know, leave now, you're allowed to leave now, get out, go. Uh, He and his mother came over at at that point. So could you share with my listeners the differences between the two cultures of Puerto Rico and Cuba? Yeah. I mean, the the biggest difference is that Cubans uh, prefer black beans and Puerto Ricans eat red beans. (laughs) So, uh, other than that, they both share a passion for pork and plantains and great music uh, and big parties and uh, a, a deep commitment and investment in family. I mean, yeah. it, it's really interesting the way family works in a Hispanic environment and perhaps other cultures are like this too, but everyone that you loved and trusted was family. I mean, I had aunts and uncles with no blood relation, but they're aunts and uncles and I've got cousins who... Are, are no blood relation, but they're cousins. And, you know, the shirt comes off your back if someone else needs it. And there's no such thing as a small family gathering, right? It, there's no select group of, of anything. It's, it's all, all the people all the time. And the front door is always open. It's a wonderful way to grow up. That sounds wonderful. And you shared with me, you have a blended family now. What's life like with the kids? How many do you have? And mm-hmm summer plans. I mean, I imagine you're in the throes of trying to figure out how to keep them busy. Yeah. So I I joke that I acquired uh, two additional children by mergers and acquisitions. So I (laughs) was remarried last year and uh, my husband has two daughters. So at this point, we've got six kids. Uh, Let's see, they're 19, 16, 13, 12, 11, and 10. Oh, wow. Uh, so it, we're we're a full house. Uh, the kids are heavily involved in pretty much every sport. They always pick the sports that require a huge investment in equipment. So right. our garage is like a sporting goods store. Yeah. So, so I mean, summer looks in some ways it's busier, and in some ways it's easier because you know there's no school and homework, which is the bane of all parents' existence. I think the last few years we take a trip to Vermont. My husband's born and raised in Vermont. Okay. I like it because there's no cell phone service in, you know, like 95% of the state. So we get, we get a little house on a lake and let the kids swim and Sounds make wonderful. s'mores. It's, it's great. Uh, I think we will try to get a trip down to Florida to see my side of the family at some point. Absolutely. And then uh, summer camps and we've got a couple of basketball enthusiast kids so we'll get some basketball training in there and yeah uh, it, nothing too complicated just some some disconnect time and some family time Lori you had mentioned so you, you brought up sports with your kids but that's also a passion of yours correct It is so I I was a swimmer and a water polo player in high school and in college I played water polo I actually I could have graduated a, a year early from college, but I, I, I didn't do that because I would have missed a water polo season. So I, st- I made some, some extra, I took, I think I took on an extra minor or something so I could stay another semester to play water polo. And then when we had the martial arts studio, I got involved in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which I did for a few years, but that was the time I really got involved in, in just general fitness. So understanding kind of what the body's capable of and how to train that. And I've been involved in CrossFit at this, I don't know, seven or eight years now. So that's a passion of mine. And through that, there there's a group of girls at my CrossFit gym that compete in bodybuilding. Oh, wow. And I was watching them train and just thinking like, this is a fascinating process. Just watching the evolution of the human body through the bodybuilding cycle. And I said, I, I want to do that. So I, I did uh, a bodybuilding show in 2017 and uh, I'm hoping to get back into a training cycle in the coming year. Uh, and I just got my Olympic level one coaching certificate a couple weekends ago. And the thing I love about lifting, Olympic lifting in particular, is you you really can't think about anything else when you're taking that much weight from the floor to an overhead position. I mean, it just any distraction and you miss the lift and potentially get hurt. 
So it's for me, it's just such a great way to disconnect while I engage my body and my physical fitness, uh, reset, recharge, and just clear my mind. But so yeah, I, I do stay connected to my my gym and my gym family. I love it. Thank you for sharing. So we always talk about books. Uh, what kind of recommended reading would you have for my listeners? And again, it doesn't have to, it, it could be a broad genre, whatever it might be. Sure. So I'm reading on my uh, side table right now next to the bed. I have the book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the middle of reading that one. It's beautifully written. It's challenging to read in some ways because it, it unveils some truth. And even as a diversity inclusion professional, the, some of that truth is really difficult to to get through, but it it's beautifully written. But some of my other favorites, so pretty much anything by Malcolm Gladwell, and I love him so much because he just frames things in ways that you're like, huh, I never really thought about it like that. And he looks at such a, a, a variety of topics. So I, I love anything he writes. Overwhelmed by Bridget Schultz. So good. Just talking about how we've got so much on our plate and, and how do we how do we focus in, in the midst of all that busy. Quiet by Susan Cain and Drive by Daniel Pink. So I'm probably not the only one that loves those books, but those are some of my favorites. And then if I need something to just kind of slip away, uh, one of my guilty pleasures is Dean Koontz. He's got kind of like a science fiction Stephen King vibe. Uh, so I read him from time to time too. That's so fun. Lori, last question. What makes your heart come alive? Oh, wow. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. There's so many things, Chris. There's, there's literally so many things. I mean, my family uh, does that, watching the kids grow up, my husband. My, so my husband is this deep empath. He's um, just the most emotionally attuned human I've ever met. I, I can get into these like all business phases and he, he just, he brings me back from that. Um, so that that dynamic really makes me excited. And um, the work I do every single day, uh, I mean, look, anybody that goes to work has some percentage of stuff they hate doing. I'm really fortunate that my percentage is like a single digit, right, of things I, I don't enjoy, but still have to do. Uh, I love to travel. So just getting getting to the airport and I'm like a kid in a, in a candy store. I mean, it's not like you can just go to any gate and get on that plane, but just seeing the the movement, the destinations, the the opportunity, the experiencing different cultures. I love, I love to travel. So all of these things, all of these things, I like, I like to garden. I'm not good at it. I, I, I'm, I'm mean to some of my plants. I hate to admit it. I don't mean to be, but I'm not, I just haven't developed the green thumb yet. Chris, I, I like so many, I mean, I think the, the theme of it is I just enjoy life. Like I love the fact that life, there's so many choices, so many things you can do, you can learn, people to meet. Uh, and again, I, I'm just, I'm a naturally curious person. So asking all the questions, I, I love it. Lori, it's been an honor and pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Chris, thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. Thank you everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe. Also, we would love your feedback. You can leave feedback in three easy ways. You can go to the blog post on our website. You can click give feedback link in the show notes on your device. And then thirdly, you can text the phrase LFL podcast to the number 44222. That's LFL P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And thank you. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.